the session uh, is uh, um, Kirill Malsev, and um, he will talk about uh, thermodynamics of classical uh, Schwarzschild black holes. And please, Kirill. Thank you very much, uh, Pierluigi. Uh, can my uh, slides be seen? Yeah. Excellent. Okay. <clears throat> so let me say a few words uh, to the organizers. I thank very much uh, Vincenzo, Pierluigi, and the organizing team for having me here. And I'm benefiting greatly from participating in this uh, summer school and retain excellent memories of uh, two years ago in the beautiful scenery of Orbino. So uh, today's talk will be about a paper that I uh, submitted and is currently under review on the thermodynamics of classical Schwarzschild black holes. Can you see my slides changing? Yeah. Okay, good. So there are two main motivations uh, for the study that I'm uh, presenting here. The first one is to um, revive in a way some forgotten tales about uh, the black hole thermodynamics research program before Hawking's celebrated result. And to emphasize Bekenstein's own reasoning, which I believe in uh, both the physics as well as the philosophy community gets uh, treated in a way that does not give it a merit. And the second, is that um, I would like to um, assess the thermodynamics of purely classical Schwarzschild black hole and thereby convince you that this is worth a study and there are some deep consequences uh, that I'll be arguing for arising from it. So let's start with the first part. And this will be a, a sort of a, to start with a historical overview of, of uh, some seminal results that motivate the, the research program and I'm distinguishing here between the classical and semi-classical results. When I'm talking about classical results, I mean results made in pure GR and semi-classical um, results when in some form or other quantum signatures are taken into account. So the uh, definition of uh, the event horizon applying to a Schwarzschild um, uh, radius has been um, identified by Buffingstein. Event horizon has have been introduced by Rindler in co a cosmological constant, and then applying this definition um, to black holes was indeed a novel thing, and it established that uh, event horizons or, um, or Schwarzschild rate, the Schwarzschild radius of, of a, a Schwarzschild black hole, constitutes a causal barrier and uh, a one-way membrane to information flow. Then in Bekenstein's, in Unwiller's group, Princeton, there have been some, um, there has been important study before Hawking's result on reversible and irreversible transformations of the Newman Kerr black hole. And they relied on the distinction between the total mass and the irreducible mass of the black hole. Floyd and Penrose then not only um, so Floyd and Penrose then thereupon presented a mechanism for extraction of, uh, of energy from the Kerr black hole's ergosphere, thereby reducing its uh, rotation. And then Hawking in his early 70 papers, first of all, calculated the gravitational wave emission from a black hole merger, and then has established by the classical area theorem that the horizon surface area is non-decreasing, which also, however, applies to an isolated black hole, meaning that the black hole does not bifurcate. Bekenstein then proposed the entropy formula and the generalized second law, which we'll be discussing in detail here. And uh, Bading, Cotton, Hawking, as they were formulating the four laws of black hole uh, of Newman Kerr black hole mechanics, they resisted a thermodynamic take of the result. So in the semi-classical um, uh, realm, so to say, the first one to actually apply quantum field theory on background was Sakharov in 1968. And belonging to the same Moscow school was also Zeldovich 
who was the first to predict a quantum emission originating from rotating horizons. By a scattering of slow vacuum bosonic modes by the eternal rotating curved black hole horizon. And this goes by the amplification of the quantum waves by virtue of the superradiance effect. Unru, and so his finding has been, uh, his argument was based on heuristic grounds, but Mr. and Strabinsky have, have made it more, uh, made it mathematically rigorous. And Unru thereupon, he clarified the particle composition of it in that he has shown that the incident second chemicals are never amplified by the Kerr um, black hole. Then comes Hawking's extraordinary finding of a thermal gray body radiation spectrum from a collapse rather than internal black hole event horizon. This leads to a violation of the classical area theorem he established a few years ago, prior to that, and fixed the prefactor eta in Wittgenstein's entropy and temp uh, temperature formula. Just as an outlook, Wittgenstein and Hawking then have shown that an evaporating black hole is consistent with that the generalized second law holds in that the spontaneous entropy generation at the event horizon overcompensates, it com comp compensates or overcompensates the loss in horizon area. Okay, now let's really come to the very point, the Wittgenstein's step to propose a, um, an entropy. And I would like to emphasize that there have been indeed mathematical uh, arguments in favor of it, but also thermodynamic ones, physical ones. And let's start with the, and so there has been a long and very deep process of becoming of Wittgenstein's entropy formula and the generalized second law. So the first one was the, uh, the analogy between the second law of thermodynamics and the classical area theorem, which made Wittgenstein conclude that a hypothetical black hole entropy is a function of its horizon area, both of which are supposed to be non-decreasing for an isolated system in equilibrium. Then the second important analogy was the property of additivity of the thermodynamic entropy and the theoretical observation that in a binary black hole merger, the resulting area coming out, of, coming out of the coalescence process is at least as great as the sum of the two before the collision. So this has made Wittgenstein conclude that the functional dependence is supposed to be proportional to the area. And now, the step which makes the horizon area a quantum measure. It comes about by Wheeler's input in terms of dimension analysis. In order to have a big, uh, an entropy, a unitless entropy measure, he proposed to normalize by the square of the Planck length, which he believed is the ultimate scale at which the metric will be resolved by an ultimate theory of quantum gravity. So and there we are. So then we have the, the, the formula, which is fixed up to a prefactor eta. But what is more, comparing the first law of thermodynamics to the first law of black hole mechanics, follows from there follows again mathematically that the temperature has to be proportional to the surface gravity and, uh, and to divided by the derivative of the functional dependence. A, which is constant. So temperature, what Wittgenstein calls the characteristic black hole temperature is proportional to the, the surface gravity. So now let's really come to the physical and thermodynamic way, line of reasoning that led Wittgenstein to the proposal. And the first important one has what is what I'm calling the entropy loss paradox. Wittgenstein asked himself, what happens to the entropy of of a collapsing star as it undergoes gravitational collapse. Does it vanish? The second was Maxwell's demon 
that's the way Wittgenstein phrases it in analogy to uh, the Wheeler's demon, sorry, uh, in analogy to Maxwell's demon. So the initial state is a no-hair black hole and a cup of tea. The final state is a slightly different no-hair black hole. So Wheeler asked uh, Wittgenstein's, uh, his student, how to figure out the amount of entropy lost from the changes in mass, spin, and charge of the no-hair black hole. The third and the uh, the line of reasoning that we'll be investigating in, in this uh, work is Garrock's Gedanken experiment, which posed to consider the question whether black holes in a thermodynamic cycle violate the second law. So the Bekenstein's solutions to these uh, challenges, so to say, were the area law entropy formula, the generalized second law, the Bekenstein bound, and also a non-essential feature, one can argue, the Shannon information theoretic statistical underpinning of, of, of the entropy. Okay, so let me now come to the question that I'm, I want to, to study in, the, in this work. I would like to point at a quote that, of Einstein that, um, Bekenstein put, puts in his 2001 paper, so the, the late Bekenstein. A theory is the more impressive, the greater simplicity of its, premise, of, of its premises, the more different kinds of things it relates, and the more extended its area of applicability. Therefore, the deep impression which classical thermodynamics made upon me. It is the only physical theory of a universal content concerning which I am convinced that within the framework of, of applicability of its basic concepts, it will never be overthrown. So the question that I would like to address in this work, do classical Schwarzschild black holes transcend the laws of thermodynamics? And I see three options as a response. The first one is that temperature and entropy is ill-defined. So that's the worst thing to take. And the application of thermodynamics to a classical Schwarzschild black hole is just inappropriate. The second is that temperature and entropy are well-defined, but the laws of thermodynamics are transcended. And the third is that temperature and entropy are well-defined, but the laws of thermodynamics are respected. So now let's come to the second part, the classical Schwarzschild black hole temperature. And for this, we will, we will uh, review the um, Gerach Gedanken experiment. So Gerach, this was the historical way of introducing a temperature measure to a black hole. So that's the first contemplation of the idea that a black hole might have temperature at all, and also a rigorous way of arguing of, of, for it in, in terms of a cycle thermodynamic cycle in which the Schwarzschild black holes acts as, as a perfect heat sink. So the Gedanken experiments consists of a perfectly insulating box that is radially lowered in the exterior field of a Schwarzschild black hole of mass M, capital M, from infinity towards the event horizon. The box contains a radiation gas of mass energy M in its inertial frame, a temperature T red, and entropy S red which is defined by the ratio of the mass energy it carries to the temperature. This is my own notation, by, by the way, in rephrasing uh, the problem. A rope is attached to the box, connecting it to a mechanical engine. And mechanical work is gained from the differences in the gravitational potential, which is defined as the mass of the mass energy of, of the um, of the box times the Schwarzschild potential. So the total work, work gain that, what, that is obtained as the box nears the Schwarzschild horizon, defined at 2 gm over c squared, is obtained from the difference of, of your gravitational potential energy at infinity to its potential at, at the horizon and is equal to uh, mc squared to the mass energy of, of, of the box. To help really uh, 
understand the 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 process of uh, that that is con contemplated in this Gedanken experiment. We have on the left a drawing by Fulguni printed in Wittgenstein's 1980 paper. And you see the, uh, uh, the so this is so to say uh, at infinity, where we have the engine, say, and uh, some electrical device that that is uh, which generates uh, uh, light in in the light bulb, which is operated by by uh, mechanical uh, work gained from lowering the box towards the horizon. And as we shall see in a moment. When the, the 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 box is at the horizon, mass energy will be dumped out of the box. And in, to remain in the spirit of of Wittgenstein, I, I'm proposing a uh, just 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 a um, just a comparative picture of of a, of a water well in which a bucket of water is lowered towards uh, to, to to the downside of of the well. So uh, what is now really, what really makes the Gerhard Gedanken experiment extraordinary is the ratchet effect that happens as, and what makes it also different from the classical analogy that just presented is the ratchet effect. So the mass energy of, of the radiation gas in the distant observer's frame, the one who is operating the engine at, at infinity is redshifted as a function of, 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 of the radial coordinate R and the radio redshift factor Z is determined from there. So as, as the box nears the, the horizon and prime, the mass energy of, of the box as seen from, from very far is redshifted, redshifted down to nearly zero. At this moment, the heat delta M is poured out onto the event horizon. So then the work expense to hold up to hold back up to infinity to the then equals the, the, the mass as was before minus the amount that has been dumped into the box. And the efficiency of evaluation is uh, the work gain from lowering the box ver uh, subtracted the work expense for holding it back up, essentially blue shifting it to, to its original energy, so to say. Um, and so, so, and, and so, so this is the, the work term and the heat term is the amount of heat lost. And as, as is easily figured out, the U efficiency is equal to one. So by Carnot's uh, theorem, one can compare it to the two temperatures involved. And the only way to have compatibility with unity efficiency is to assign the classical black hole a temperature of absolute zero. The operation of the thermodynamic cycle requires to refill the box with energy delta M, which has been lost from a hot thermal reservoir and which allows to repeat the process in cycles. So now let's discuss, let's discuss this, uh, this finding. So um, a zero temperature violates the second and a third law, the third law of thermodynamics. Also, when comparing it to, to the, to Bekenstein Hawking's uh, temperature formula, it shows independence of the surface gravity area or mass of, of the black hole. So how to reconcile these things? And so the reconciliation comes about by taking the classical limit of, of the Hawking temperature. But the key question that I would like to address is what, how, how exactly are we doing this? Do we set h bar equals zero? Or do we let h bar only asymptotically tend to zero? There have been numerous arguments against idealizations in Garrock's construction. I have enumerated a few of them here, and I'm not crossing out. I'm crossing out um, some of these, not because these, these are false or anything, but I'm considering the relevance for the 
question I'm asking for classical Schwarzschild equals. So quantum buoyancy due to Hawking radiation cannot occur because the classical black hole is at play. So the rope cannot sustain an infinite redshift. It's also, uh, so to say, ruled out because as of the ideal rope uh, is, is used. So this is not something that I'm questioning here. And if uh, gravitational radiation emission into and from the Schwarzschild black hole, uh, first proposed by Bekenstein in his 72 paper and also argued. Uh, so Bekenstein 72 proposed that an infalling box will, will, will radiate gravita gravitational energy into, uh, into the, 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 the black hole. And Curiel in his 15 paper argued that uh, the perturbation of, of, the, of the Schwarzschild black hole could allow to, uh, to, to would, uh, give a different assessment, let's put it in this, these words of, of the experiment. Um, so I'm not considering these because the slow, the, I, this, the processes assume to uh, be performed adiabatically and quasi-stationary. But Bekenstein's own solution to it was pr to propose that the thermal wavelength needs to fit inside the, 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 the box. And this is what I would like to uh, further, further consider here. So the box sphere of, uh, of radius L, let's introduce uh, the, the size of, of, of the box, needs to be finite in order to fit the thermal wavelength in there, which is anti-proportional to, um, to, to its temperature. So in order for it to be non-zero, the energy redshift cannot be quite zero. And we can make this more uh, precise in that uh, calculating the proper distance in the inertial frame of the box center of mass to the horizon, assuming a, a small distance delta r away of, 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 of the uh, horizon, and setting this proper distance expression, which depends on the mass and obviously on, on, the, on the small distance uh, considered setting this equal to, to, the, to the size of the box allows to calculate how, how far away from the distant observer's frame the box is allowed to be placed before pouring out the radiation. So this results in a reduction of work gain accounting for the redshift. So one, one cannot, so to say, fully leverage the entire uh, weight of the mass energy of the box right up, up to the horizon, but just a small distance off. And this is what is taken care of in this uh, re reduction of work gain, which now is dependent on, on, the, on the redshift. And uh, similar, uh, similarly for the hauling back up of the box. And what does this mean for the efficiency of evaluation? This means that finally taking the difference of the work and dividing by the uh, heat uh, cost, so to say, one obtains one minus Z and where Z is the redshift factor. So as the distance delta R tends to, to zero, but doesn't actually reach it, results in that the temperature of, of the, the black hole cannot, can only approach it arbitrarily close, but doesn't actually reach the zero point. So this is, how the validity of the third law of thermodynamics, as I see it, is restored. Equipped with this, we can now review Carter's original argument from 1973 to argue against, at that time, um, characteristic temperature that Bekenstein had proposed. It goes somewhat like this. A classical black hole with a temperature greater than zero is, is immersed in a, into a radiation gas with a gas that is lower than the uh, temperature of the black hole. The black hole acts as a perfect absorber of the radiation without ejecting it. So the Clausius statement of the second law is violated, and there is no possibility to, to attain a thermal equilibrium for the joint system. So I'm now re-evaluating this argument for the case that the temperature of the black hole is asymptotically close to zero. So one does not arise because the closer one gets to the horizon, the, the colder it is, 
So one can, can it's physically impossible to have a gas temperature that is smaller than the black hole temperature. But two is interestingly still an issue because the condition of a thermal equilibrium of say the horizon, the cold horizon of a black hole and another test body can never be fulfilled. So uh, it can, can never be established. So the zeroth law can, can, cannot, uh, uh, yeah, zero, the, the condition of the zeroth law to hold cannot be fulfilled. So the way I present, I suggest to go about this is to give a refrigerator, refrigerator interpretation of the classical flash black hole. To say that the classical event horizon is, is an asymptotically zero Kelvin thermostat and the surface gravity at the horizon is doing the work to maintain the horizon temperature such that any inflowing heat onto the horizon is transferred by the mechanical heat pump, which is the gravitation into an external thermal reservoir, the black hole interior, entirely isolated from, from, from its exterior. So there is an important uh, impact of, of this interpretation that I'm suggesting, namely that a non-stopping gravitational work from the mass inertia of, of, the, of, of, of the black hole leads to conceive it, the horizon gravitation as a perpetual space motion. Moreover, this motion does not decay. So there is no friction involved to stop, to stop it moving. And this is why I'm arguing that classical Schwarzschild black holes are, are a perpetual motion mobilis of the third kind. However, they are not perpetual mobilis of first or second kind because there is, first of all, no power supply and no net energy production. In the interest of time, I won't be discussing this further. The only thing I want to to remark further uh, is that uh, I believe in the semi-classical description of, of Schwarzschild black holes, the perpetuum mobile interpretation breaks down if one conceives Hawking radiation as a vacuum friction effect. So now let's kind of rush through the entropy thing. There is little time left, but I'm kind of trying to do my best. So um, the classical limit of the Bekenstein Hawking entropy formula, taking H, letting h bar 10 to zero is divergent. This is fully consistent with the phenomenological thermodynamics of, of, of entropy in that there is a divergent heat cost for extraction of useful work from a stationary Schwarzschild black hole. So what does this mean for the uh, uh, perpetuum mobile classification that I'm suggesting? So the extraction of work from the Schwarzschild uh, um, black hole gravitational energy reservoir is impossible. So there is no violation of the second law. I would like to point at the su subtle uh, difference in that the, in the Garrick thermodynamic cycle, one converts an input heat and extract any gravitation energy from the mass of the black hole, which is irreducible. Walt in 1997 uh, uh, pointed the, out that classical curved black holes violate the Nernst statement of the third law. So either I'm missing out a point of, in his argument, but or there is a simple response to it, which I'm suggesting in, in that there is a difference between it. Kelvin, Kelvin uh, the, the, the Planck and the uh, Nernst statement of it. And there might be some confusion on, on either side on his or, or mine, which, which might be more likely, but I would like to see where I'm wrong. So as one takes the limit of H bar to, to, to zero, the entropy of, of, of the classical black hole diverges of a continuous value range. So neighboring entropy states of the classical Schwarzschild black hole are arbitrarily close apart from one another. So that's why delta SBH tends to zero. So the classical black hole violates the Planck but respects the Nernst statement according to my understanding. Okay, so um, there has been a, a part by a violation of the generalized second law in that if you, if you dump, uh, as you dump 
the heat delta m onto the horizon and the, the, the heat of this as seen from, from, a, from a distant observer's point of view is nearly zero. There, you also dump entropy with it, divided, which is defined as delta m over t rad. That's what you put in into the box before you start the, 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 the before you send off the parcel, so to say. And so the area increase is calculated from the first law of, of, uh, of electron mechanics. And as you transport enough, large enough entropy to the, to the black hole and let, dump it in, in there at the horizon, the area increase, because of this, the redshift, does not compensate the, 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 uh, the entropy loss. And this, is, this apparent violation is what led Bekenstein to propose the Bekenstein bound which places a universal upper limit on the entropy to energy range ratio for bounded systems in a confined region of space. So you, 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 have, you have a system of energy E, which is confined into an effective sphere of R and the entropy that can be contained in this region of space for that given energy is bounded by this formula. And we will see how, how the GSL violating counterexamples are, are blocked by this. So the generalized second law written out states that the area change in the horizon uh, times some constants minus the uh, radiation, the, 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 um, so the generalized second law applied to this case reads that the area increase must compensate the loss in, in, in the entropy Left, lost, lost behind as one pours out the radiation. So the area increase, as, as, as noted, come, is from the first law and the mass transfer onto the black hole from, from the redshift formula quoted before. And Bekenstein uh, gives a first order expansion of it to arrive at this minimal area increase, which depends on, on this delta r distance. Then assuming that uh, the, the, the entropy is bounded by the Bekenstein bound, then there's only a, 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 a finite delta R min, which allows to pack a given entropy at uh, 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 the entropy of a system at given energy. So evaluating this, pl plugging these delta A min and uh, as read using the Bekenstein into the generalized second law formula comes out. So the minimal distance delta R min determines the redshift delta M prime. And so for whatever small delta M, the gain in, in the horizon area will always compensate the, the area loss. So you see it from, 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 the, from this formula because delta R min is really the maximum packing of, of the entropy to energy ratio. And this relation, what is important for my question, retains its validity in the classical limit as we take the, as we let h bar tend to zero on either side of the inequality. So the general second law persists to hold for a classical Schwarzschild black hole. So, but one thing that we haven't yet discussed, how far can we actually get to the horizon to perform the thermodynamic cycle? And um, um, recap Bekenstein's original argument from 73, that there must be a minimal box size in order to accommodate a given wavelength of, of radiation. This translates to this trans translates to this demand, uh, the requirement for the local frame to, to be L uh, apart center of mass to the horizon. And this also translates into a condition uh, um, of, uh, from an, of, of the distance from a distant observer's point of view, which matters because this is from where we actually evaluate the efficiency of the thermodynamics cycle from the distant observer's point of view. And so Current physics doesn't place any upper bound on temperature. So as we let the radiation temperature tend to infinity, it can get arbitrarily close. But there is an issue to this and that I would like to point out. So when the proper distance equals the, the, the size of the box, the bottom of the box actually touches the event horizon. And from the distant observer's point of view, the bottom of the box in Schwarzschild coordinates freezes. 
So the radiation drop suffers from an infinite time delay. And so already this does not allow to process, uh, progress this reversibly. But also the area growth, assuming that um, the, the, the entropy is being transformed meanwhile, the, 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 the gain in size of the black hole starts to drown the, the box, so to say. So it's kind of eating up it from, from, from below. So this is the picture I would like to suggest here as, a, uh, as, as a, an improved proposal. Sorry, Kirill, the time is almost up. Uh, yeah, so this is the sli last slide, actually. Yeah, so th the way to go about this that I'm suggesting is we need to place the box, the bot we need to leave some space off between the bottom of the box and the event horizon from the distant observer's frame. And this minimal distance between the, the bottom of the box and the event horizon, I suggest to, to calculate it from the bekenstein bremermann limit of uh, entropy bandwidth, so to say. So conceive here the volume enclosed inside the box and the minimal volume enclosed between the box edge and the horizon. Then the, the maximum entropy that can be fitted inside this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, enclosed volume is given by, uh, by the bound. And uh, ha having done, so this actually translates into, into a simple requirement to just double the, the, the distance. So you have the, the, the length of the, of, the, of the box and you need to leave the same length apart in order to, to leave some space for, 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 for the transfer of entropy. But only a Schwarzschild saturates the Bekenstein bound. So this maximal packing of entropy in this finite region of space can only be approximated. So and assuming a minimal black hole area increase, then the thermodynamic cycle can be completed reversibly. So this is my summary. And uh, so we've seen that there are some classical and semi-classical results of black hole thermodynamics. And we've seen the motivation for Bekenstein entropy from analogies and algebraic arguments, but also thermodynamic arguments. The question that I've been asking is, do classical Schwarzschild black holes transcend the laws of thermodynamics? And the response that I'm giving is that um, from the Gerhoch Gedanken experiment and Bekenstein's response to, response to it, the temperature can only asymptotically uh, reached the zero point. From there, I concluded that the third law is respected. And also, the, the, the res this is reconcilable with the classical limit as the classical limit of the Hawking temperature. I've also reviewed the Carter argument and presented the refrigerator interpretation of, 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 the, of the horizon thermostat, which led me, however, to conclude that it constitutes a perpetual mobility of the third kind. When taking the classical limit of the Bekenstein Hawking entropy formula, it is divergent. And therefore, I believe there is no violation of the second law. And the perpetuum mobile of third kind interpretation does not violate its laws. So the Nern statement is also respected. And the Bekenstein bound allows to restore validity of the generalized second law, which survives its classical limit. I've then posed the irreversibility challenge summarized as freezing and drowning. However, doubling the minimal horizon distance from the Bekenstein bounded entropy bandwidth still makes it uh, an entropy measure that is um, uh, still allows to perform the cycle in, in uh, um, reversibly. So thanks a lot. And uh, I'll look forward to the discussion. Thanks, Kirill. Uh, thanks again. Uh, okay. Uh, questions, suggestions, and uh, clarifications. Please use the chat. Enrico, please. 
Hi, Kira. Thank, thanks for the talk. It was very, very, very interesting. Uh, I just wanted to ask more clarification, maybe because maybe maybe I missed this, but why why exactly did you exclude the other three possible responses to Garok's Gedanken experiment, and you only focused on Bekenstein's? Yeah, very good question, actually. And uh, so the, my way of thinking goes about this goes in the following way: Hawking proved in a way by the thermal black body spectrum that semi-classical black holes do produce radiation. So there is a thermal aspect to, to black holes. So therefore I exclude option one. And then the only option left is just to discriminate between uh, whether the laws are respected or transcended. So this is a simple answer to, to, to a profound question, but th that's what I'm assuming in this argument. I think there is more to say about this, but not as far as I'm concerned in this work, emanating from the fact that it is true that semi-classical Hawking temperature is the appropriate measure of associated with the temperature of the black hole. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Eric, please. So um, again, I want to, before I, I, I ask, I wanna make sure, are there any of the students or other people who want to ask questions? I can always enter my questions and comments on Slack. Okay. Okay, um, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. So, um, uh, 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 Carol, um, uh, I thought that was a, a really um, a, a really invigorating uh, talk. I mean, of course, you're you're talking about things that are that are near and dear to my heart. So I, you know, I, I, th I think I think it's great. Um, I I have um, w one thing that I wasn't sure about though is why is it that when you are considering um, what the class what attempt what a temperature and entropy what might be an appropriate way to think about the entropy and temperature for a classical black hole. Why is why do, um, do you take the um, the quantum quantities and let, let h bar go to zero? That's not what we do in any other part of thermodynamics or statistical mechanics. If I'm thinking about the classical entropy of my cup of tea, I don't think about its you know its Planck its its Planckian back black body radiation. And in order to calculate the classical temperature, I don't take the Planckian black body radiation and let h bar go to zero, that would give me zero temperature for the T, just like here. So uh, what, why, why I, I don't understand the relevance of, um, of this idea of, it, if you're talking about classical temperature and classical entropy, h bar just doesn't seem relevant to me at all. It, 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 just, doesn't, it just doesn't enter the question. Well, the way I go about this is, um, first of all, that, there is already a well-defined uh, formula for, uh, for for the temperature of, of the black hole. So from Hawking's uh, gray body spectrum. So, and now the next thing to, 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 to consider is how does this uh, com compare or how does this um, relate to Gerroch's Gnagn experiment? So the Gerroch Gnagn experiment supposes that uh, the temperature of the black hole is independent of A, kappa, uh, or M. And so, so there's a tension, right? So there, we have the classical temperature on the one side, which is supposed to be zero, and the Hawking temperature, which is very, very small for, for, for astrophysically re relevant black holes, but non-zero. So there must be some, some mediation bet between these. And I know you, you argue in, in, by, 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 by means of... Uh, saying that the surface gravity is thermodynamic in, in a way. I'm going a different way. I see the H bar as the, 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 the coupling, so to say, or the, as some, think of it like an effect, a transition constant. So when the, this constant has been introduced in, in, in the 19th century uh, statistical mechanics, it was, I mean, it was just a measure to, 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 to sample the phase space, so to say, in, 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 in units to, to make the statistical mechanical account tractable. So just think of it in this way. So you, you, you have some kind of quantity and that which you use to, to, um, to quantify 
or count states in a way in the phase space. And so in the very limit, you have it as H bar. So that's what, where, when you are at the quantum domain. But think of another context where you don't actually make this assumption and you have, uh, you, you have things like an effective plan constant where it's not actually the, the its value, it's super low value, but you just scale it up and down. And so that's what I'm also su uh, suggesting here. And what I find interesting is that by making the H bar non-zero, you also recover some scaling with the surface gravity. So you do not only have it like close to uh, cl close to zero, but the, the, the smaller the black hole, the, the hotter it will actually be even in this classical limit. So that's what I find compelling about the solution that I'm that I'm suggesting. Yeah, my my question had nothing whatsoever to do with my own arguments. Um, I'm I'm putting those entirely aside. Yeah, yeah, I see. Uh, but uh, no, I'm I'm still I, I still don't really follow because as far as I can tell, what if what you're saying is right for black holes, it should be right for my cup of tea. But no one in their right mind would ever say there, there there's a paradox here. The, the black body radiation from my T has this Planckian temperature. And if I let H bar go to zero, look, my cup of tea has zero temperature. I mean, I just, I, 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 what, why is this argument relevant for black holes, but not for my cup of tea? Well, because when you want to measure the, the, the temperature of your cup of tea, in classical thermodynamics, you would stick a thermometer meter to it, right? So it, yeah. you would take a thermometer, and you would measure its temperature. So you have some immediate contact of, of, your, your, uh, of the thermometer to, to your T, or at least the environment of, of the T just, just above the surface, right? And so this is what, what is done in the thermodynamics, Gerhoff's thermodynamic cycle. You have an immediate contact between the box and, and, the, um, yeah, and, and, and the horizon, right? And so this, that's the classical way of thinking about temperature. And Hawking presented the, the quantum way of thinking about it. So now, the, so you have these two things in, in, in a way, and one needs to, 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 to find an agreement between these. But, but I, I do take the point that um, it is interesting to compare how the temperature of, of say, an ordinary sum of body is given its quantum descri description, and how does this compare to its phenomenological um, some effective field theory or, or, or so description. So how do these relate? And I think this is worth a study and to, to look more closer into. Okay, thank you.